Let's join together in prayer. Father, I ask that as we turn to your word this morning, you would speak to us. Whatever the point of our need is, would you highlight that and help us to be open to your word and to receive it and to act upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this short passage in the Acts of the Apostles uh, brings us to what is called a sharp disagreement. Uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 39, the first part of that verse, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Wow, the great apostle Paul and Barnabas, the son of encouragement, had a fallout and parted company. In discussing the idea of revisiting churches, they had begun on their first missionary journey together. Paul disagreed with Barnabas, who wanted to bring John Mark with them. He was his cousin. But Paul was against the idea because Mark had deserted them in a place called Pamphylia. Acts 13 and verse 13 refers to that. Luke, who, as the author of Acts, remember a traveling companion of Paul, remember was a doctor. And he uses quite an interesting word, and this is the commentators uh, tell me this, not my own expertise in Greek. But uh, Luke uses a word, paroxymos, uh, uh, or paroxysmos, uh, maybe is the better way of pronouncing it. Uh, and as a doctor, he uses a word that is something connected with a medical term. Uh, and uh, Tom Wright, the commentator, says this, and I quote, when the word is used in a medical context, it can mean convulsion. It carries overtones of severely heightened emotions, red and distorted faces, loud voices, things said that were better left unsaid, a sorry sight. And quote, make no mistake, this was a furious row. And it was a row between two of the leading figures in the early church undignified and convulsive. Let's be honest, it happens in church circles, doesn't it? I'm often amazed at the things that are said in churches by church members to each other. You know, I think sometimes there are things said by Christians to other Christians that if you were in a secular workplace and heard that said, you'd be up on an employment tribunal. Why is it that in our churches, we can say such sad things and have such arguments one with the other. Very wary of giving examples from personal experience, but the individual died some years ago. But I remember in my first charge uh, in one of the congregations after a sermon I was preaching and I had spoken of the uniqueness of Jesus as the only way of salvation. I had spoken of the need for people to respond to the gospel of Christ and to accept Jesus as Savior. And a man who was, I have to say, an elder, took me to task at the door of the church at the end of the service. He said, don't you dare tell me, you wee whippersnapper from the back streets of Belfast, that I need to be saved. He said, my father's buried there, and he pointed to the church graveyard around the church my grandfather's buried there, and my father's buried there. I'll be buried there, and my sons will be buried there after I come. So don't you dare tell me that we need Jesus. The sense of animosity was really very real, and that was an argument and a disagreement that, sadly, we were never able to uh, make over. And sometimes that's the way it goes, sharp disagreements. But there can be disagreements, and, you know, sometimes in churches... It strangely is not always about, or even most of the time, about theological disagreements, but about small things. And in Paul and Barnabas's case, it was Paul didn't want John Mark to go with them, and Barnabas did. And so they fell out, not over theology, not over church practice, but just what Paul thought would be good for the missionary journey. This was a convulsive breakup of a partnership and a friendship. Uh, and we know that Barnabas and Mark then go off west across the Mediterranean Sea to Cyprus, and Paul takes Silas with them northwards to uh, the, the, the country ahead of them. So disagreements happen. The second thing I think we notice from these verses is God's grace. 
And I, I love this, and let me, let me read uh, verse 39, the second part of that verse, uh, through to the end of 41. Uh, and uh, we read this. So, Barnabas takes Mark off to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Here's the crazy thing. Because of the argument, regardless of who was right or wrong, the early church ended up with two missionary journeys instead of one. Isn't that incredible? One team goes off to Cyprus to preach the gospel, and the other team heads north to preach the gospel and to strengthen the churches. By the grace of God, more blessing followed. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we need to fight with each other and have arguments with each other, and that will help the gospel. Not at all. But isn't it amazing how God overruled? And it's a reminder to us that God works in spite of our attitudes or despite the things that we do. In God's work, we recognize it's not our work, but His. He is in control of what will happen. He is the one who is working even through our human weaknesses. Yes, we're called to be faithful and obedient servants of Christ, but Christian faith and service are not actually about us, but about the Lord our God and our Father. But there's something else good happened later on because reconciliation took place, and we know that from the writing of Paul himself. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11, writing from prison, Paul tells Timothy this, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. What? John Mark that he didn't want to have anything to do with, didn't want to bring him on a second missionary journey, and now he's saying, get Mark because he's helpful to me reconciliation must have taken place. Or look at Colossians 4 and verse 10. Colossians 4.10, Paul tells the church, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. There's Paul looking out for John Mark and saying to the, the, the Christians in Colossae, do welcome this man. You've received instructions how to help him. Uh, and writing to Philemon, Paul described Mark as, quote, my fellow worker. We don't know if Paul had to forgive Mark or if Mark had to forgive Paul, nor are we told of how things panned out with Barnabas. But I suspect if Paul and Mark were reconciled, then surely he and Barnabas were too. I certainly like to think so. Reconciliation is possible by the grace of God. So here are these few verses, and when I read them, first of all, I really blessed your minister for giving them to me. Uh, but then as I thought about them, what on earth could we learn? And I thought, well, I think there's ways here of learning how to do church as followers of Jesus. And I have a number of points, and I'm sometimes a little bit worried that these points are a bit thinly spread, but a number of things just flowed into my mind. And the first thing is this, doing church is about being reconcilers. Why is it in some circles that reconciliation seems to be a distasteful word? Is it maybe because it's, it's uh, associated with political uh, machinations? I don't know. But the whole point of Christianity is that sinners are reconciled to God through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He bore our sins he took our punishment. He deflected the wrath of God we deserve from us to him. And just as forgiven people need to be forgiving, reconciled people need to be reconcilers. And here's the thing. If we can't be reconciled to one another in church circles, how can we ever say anything to the world about the power of Jesus to reconcile the world to a holy God? The Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in Philippi, and he made a direct appeal to two ladies in that church who had obviously fallen out. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that maybe they, having been leaders and helpers in the church, maybe they'd got to the stage where they weren't speaking to each other. Maybe they were attending some of the same meetings and refused to sit close to each other. They wouldn't speak at all. Paul writes in Philippians 4, and verses 2 and 3, these words. I plead with you, Odia, and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. 
Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. When you see what Paul is getting at, he says, here are two women who are prominent in the church and they have had a fallout, a disagreement. This is Paul who knows what it's like to have a disagreement with someone. And he says, I plead with them. Agree together in the Lord. And you see, the strange thing is this. We sometimes neglect the fact that each one of us who claims to be a follower of Jesus, having been reconciled to God through Christ, we are all reconciled to God through the same work of Jesus on the cross. And therefore, as brothers and sisters in Christ, how can we therefore be in a position where we fall out and refuse to be reconciled with someone else who is in Christ with us, in the body of Christ. To be reconciled is therefore to make sure that the body of Christ is kept whole. To be unreconciled with others is to disfigure and harm the body of Christ. We destroy the body by falling out and not being reconciled one with the other. And so I have a, a question for you this morning. And it says, is there another Christian, maybe in church or in your family or in your wider circle, whom you've had a falling out with, someone you refuse to speak to or who refuses to speak to you? Sadly, it's not always possible to reconcile as it takes two willing people to do so. But if you're in such a situation, don't wait for the other to make the first move. And, and don't say anything like, I'll forgive them if they forgive me. And, uh, you know, if, if you say that, I'll forgive you if you forgive me, that's not forgiveness at all. You need to forgive no matter what the other person does. I hesitate to give personal examples, but uh, let, me, let me give a couple I remember as a 15-year-old, my father's business was stolen from him. I may have mentioned this before, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I knew as a young Christian I had to forgive the individual who had stolen my father's business. He was made bankrupt. Uh, and uh, so as a good Christian, I prayed about it. I said, Lord, I forgive this, this individual. And one day I was walking up the street in Belfast, and my dad's lorry passed by with this man driving it. And I felt like a palpitation in my heart. And I realized that forgiveness had not been complete. It was like a journey. And I was never able to meet this man, never able to communicate, never able to say to him, I forgive you. But I realized then that forgiveness for some is not just an immediate transaction, but a journey that needs to be undertaken. And so I never had the opportunity to personally reconcile. And that's the sad fact of life sometimes. We had a situation in the church I served, and I'm, this is where I, I, I need to try and be careful. We, we, let me put it this way. We had two groups who did similar things in the church. And one group was thriving, the other group was failing. Uh, and the, the leader of one group said of the leader of the other group, I hate so-and-so. Uh, and uh, there was animosity between people serving in the same church doing similar work. And a godly person in one of the groups said, Ken, I'm going to get the leaders or the office bearers of these two groups together in my home. I want you to come and speak in reconciliation. Uh, and you can imagine that I went into a situation that was quite fraught. Uh, and I, I outlined what I felt was a biblical basis of reconciliation. Then I said, let's pray. And the first person to pray was the leader of one group who had said that they hated the person of the other group. Uh, and that person prayed for the other, and then the second person to pray was the other person who prayed for this person. Uh, uh, and as we then began to work things through over a period of a couple of years, we decided to disband both groups and bring them together in one group where everybody was welcome to share in ministry in the one group. And that was the way it worked, and reconciliation took place. And so my plea is, if there is an individual or a group or a situation where a sharp disagreement like Paul and Barnabas had has come up, be reconcilers. That, I think, is the first step in our discipleship. 
Another point is this. I think we need to believe in team ministry. Let me ask you a question that was asked of me some years ago. I'm not going to ask you to uh, shout out to me, but where is the first team in the Bible? Have a think about that. Where is the first team in the Bible? Uh, and that question was asked of me. My, uh, one of my representative elders and I went to a conference and leading larger churches uh, and the speaker in the seminar asked that question. All these ministers from all over the United Kingdom and people were saying, oh, I think it's Moses and the elders. Or people were saying, I think it's Adam and Eve working together to name the creatures that God had made. Nobody got the answer. All these clergy, well-educated, clever people. What was the answer? What would you answer? Where's the first team in the Bible? Genesis chapter 1. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working in creation. And there's something very fundamental about the nature of God, this mysterious God that we maybe don't understand fully the concept of the Trinity, how a God can be three persons in one, that like the three-leafed clover, the same stem but three expressions. But if God in his nature and in his very intrinsic being is team, then it strikes me that we in the church need to be part of team together. That's embedded in the concept of the church as the body of Christ, all working together under the headship of Jesus, but each part of the body doing his or her part to make the whole function as it should. Paul and Silas went off as a team. Later on, Timothy joined them when they visited Lystra. And of course, Luke, the author of Acts, was with them as well. If you're interested in this idea, look at the end of, or look at Romans chapter 16. An incredible list, I haven't counted up the number, but an incredible list of men and women whom Paul said were co-workers with him. He could not have done his ministry without the help of others working in teams. Jesus sent disciples out in ministry by twos. He never sent them out as individuals, but always in team. And whatever your place in the body of Christ, you're needed and valued because without you, the body of Christ is not as effective or works as well as it should. Team is important. I think there's also another thing here that reminds us that churches need to have both an inward and an outward focus. If you see what Paul and Barnabas were doing, they were setting off to Cilicia and the whole purpose of Paul's second missionary journey, quite apart from preaching the gospel, was to strengthen and encourage churches. And so the church needs building and strengthening through mutual encouragement and learning how to do discipleship together. That's the inward focus, if you like. But evangelism and mission are always important because they are two sides of the same coin. Theologian Emil Brunner put it this way, and I quote, the church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. It's endemic to the church that if it's going to live, then mission must be at the heart of what we do. It's the DNA of Christianity. Jesus told the disciples they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if I was a native of Analong, I'd like to think that our Jerusalem here is Analong, our Judea is Northern Ireland, our Samaria is the south of Ireland. Don't forget, we are the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Uh, and what a wonderful privilege and joy it is to see some church plants going on in the south of Ireland. Uh, and of course, the ends of the earth are just that, the ends of the earth. The truth is that we all have places to be witnesses in. It starts in your home starts in where you spend your Monday to Friday, your working day. As disciples of Jesus, we are to work to the Lord in whatever we put our hand to day after day. I'm excited about what you're planning. I see this little card here in the, in the pulpit, Life at the Crossroads, 11th to the 18th of May next year in 2025. Uh, I'm excited about that. It is great to see a church interested in mission. But I wonder, when you look at what's happening in the church life of Ulster, do you recognize that many congregations are giving poorly to mission and evangelism and to the work of the Lord? 
And so do we need to pray that God will release generosity towards mission and evangelism? Do we need to pray about our own financial giving and our prayer priorities? And the question is this, if we believe that the church has to have an inward and an outward focus, what are you doing to grow in your faith? And what are you doing to advance the mission of the church? And another thing that struck me from these uh, verses was that we need to make sure the church is a support base. Locals in Acts 15 and verse 40 commended the team, quote, to the grace of the Lord. Previously, the Antioch church sent Paul's team out with their blessing and authority, Acts 13 and 3, uh, and that was the original commissioning of Paul and Barnabas. And then they reported back to the church at Antioch in Acts 14 and 27. This partnership between missionary or evangelist and a home-based church is, I believe, very important. It's important for how we understand how God seeks to work in our own lives, but also in the lives of those serving him overseas. There's another point which I'll, I'll not spend time on, but it, it struck me uh, here. We, we'll be looking at this actually next week uh, in Acts chapter 16 and verses 6 to 8. This is part of next week's uh, talk, but uh, Paul and his companions, verse 6 of 16, uh, traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now, there, there's a good one to get my teeth into next week. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. How on earth did that work? So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. And I guess part of what we'll be looking at next week is this idea that human plans and God's guidance go hand in hand. God encourages us to use our brains to work out what we think we should be doing, but to do so in association with praying and with asking that God the Spirit would guide and lead. And so we look at that next week. But there's one final thing I want us to think of this morning, but very quick. Remember that failure need not be terminal. It was the grace of God that enabled Barnabas and Mark, Paul and Silas, to keep ministering in spite of their bust up. And do you also remember Peter? He was the leader in the church who helped frame the document that the Council of Jerusalem sent to the uh, church in Antioch, telling them that they did not need to believe in Jesus plus circumcision, but just believe in Jesus. Well, remember Peter. He was the man who swore, Lord, I'm going to die for you. I will do anything for you. I will give up my life for you. And then when Jesus was arrested, Peter flees. And even though he had been warned by Jesus, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times, he denied him three times. And then the Bible says he wept bitterly. He must have thought, this is it. I have blown it. I have nowhere to go, nothing to do for Jesus. And do you remember after his resurrection, Jesus sought Peter out on the lake shore. Uh, and in the discourse in John's gospel, uh, there's a, a lovely sense of Jesus both challenging Peter but also affirming him. Uh, and let me just deal with the affirmations. He said to Peter, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. And then finally he said, follow me. If anyone could say that failure wasn't final, it surely would have been Peter, hugely influential leader in the church, helping solve the situation in Antioch that Paul and Barnabas reported back to the church in Jerusalem uh, and used by God greatly in spite of failure. And so I want to finish with this. I like asking questions. I hope you don't mind. But I wonder, is there anybody in church this morning who feels a spiritual failure? Uh, I, I read a book that I don't think I'll recommend to you what is a Family by Edith Schaefer. Uh, and my wife and I both felt enormously guilty as parents 
because this woman, this wonderful, godly woman, had this incredible view of making family, uh, uh, and she had this family that came from all over the world every year, and they'd meet every year at Christmas, and they'd have a theme, and they'd all dress up according to the theme, and it just made my wife and I exhausted. Uh, and maybe, you know, we have, sadly, in our family, some who love the Lord and are following Jesus, and some not. Uh, and sometimes we look at families and their children are dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and they're doing everything as they should and, and you think, how did they manage that? It's so easy to feel a spiritual failure. But maybe there's also been for some of us a disobedience or something that we've done that we're just deeply ashamed of and embarrassed about and we feel God really won't accept us. Well, remember Peter and remember Jesus. Oh yes, Jesus challenged Peter, do you love me? And Peter got a bit upset and said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And I wonder this morning if there's someone here who just needs released from that failure. And Jesus wants to say to you today, do you love me? And if you say, yes, Lord, I love you, he will reinstate you, reconstitute your service, and he will say, feed my sheep. Do you love me, said Jesus? What is your answer to that question? So I, I, I worry a wee bit this morning that I've kind of gone over a lot of things very simply and very thinly. But let me just reiterate, be a reconciler, be a team player, have an inward and an outward focus, make church your support base for fellowship, for discipleship, for teaching, for encouragement, for guidance. Make sure that your plans and God's guidance go hand in hand. And remember, failure is never final. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that no matter how badly we mess up, and here was the great Apostle Paul falling out, the paroxysm of convulsive disagreement uh, and separating from the man who was an encouragement to him and yet later was reconciled to John Mark. Lord, help us to learn lessons from this as to how to do church, how to be church. But above all, help us to remember that no life is irredeemable, no failure is irrecoverable, and that when we come to you and hear your words, do you love me? May we say, yes, Lord, and know that you say, feed my sheep. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.